I can turn around. Okay. Okay, I'd like to introduce you to Krista Bender, and uh, we, are, we are blocking the screen, but that's okay. So I met Krista <laughs> because she was living in an apartment overlooking Notre Dame, and she said, I'd really like to buy this apartment, but my friends are telling me <laughs> that it's too expensive and it's, I shouldn't do it. And I said, well, let me come look at it, you know? And of course, it's a jewel. It's absolutely a jewel. The views are fantastic. And I said, you're nuts if you don't buy it. Mm -hmm. That's how we met, OK? And so she bought it. And then we did a House Hunters International together, OK? Along with her friend Stanley. Where's Stanley? Stan right. Stanley's over there. Stanley's in the show, too, OK? And then Krista went away, and she did all these amazing things, like write a book. Where's your book? Let me see your book. It's my copy with all my notes. But. Okay, well, that's her copy. <laughs> Paris, My Beautiful Madness. I have not read it yet. I have heard from several sources that it's fabulous. I intend to read it. There are several copies in the back for sale for 20 euros. Do not leave without your copy signed, okay? Strict orders. You know, we have a lot of writers um, who come and speak. And we need to support our writers. And in, this, in today's world, it's really difficult for them. So I urge you, whenever you have an opportunity, even though you don't want to carry it around, even though you don't want to put it on your shelf, get at least signed copies so that you can be proud of it. OK, no, I'm, I'm serious. I, I buy everybody's books because I think it's really important to do that. So for 20 bucks, you know, and not only that, but you're going you're gonna to love it. So I'm going to let Krista tell you about her world, which has to do with wine and other things, yes. and her beautiful madness. Mm -hmm. um, she's going to tell me next, 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 when yes. we're ready to do the slide. The slide. Perfect. And then we have a surprise. Yeah, we do. Okay. We do. Okay. Perfect. Are you, can you see over there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Over there. Sneaking okay. past. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here to be able to talk about this, especially in Paris of all places. Um, I live in Paris. I moved here eight years ago, and I live here on and off. I'm originally from California. You might need to project. Okay, sorry. Just because there's noise. I feel like I have a mic on. But you do, but, but there's this stupid noise from outside. <laughs> sorry. Okay, so. I live here on and off. I'm originally from California, but as Adrian said, I did purchase an apartment here. I adore it, and when I'm not here, I do rent it out, um, and that's been very successful. Tell them how, so big it's, how big it's it is. It's teeny tiny, <laughs> very tiny, 21 square meters. 21 yeah. square meters? But the architect did an amazing yeah, job. Yeah, but it's in two rooms. You, yes, <laughs> it is. It's, not, it's technically a studio, but it's two rooms, and the architect did an amazing job. It's at the top with the, uh, it was the Chambre de Bonne. So they connected both of the old maid's quarters and their floor to ceiling windows. Anyway, you'll see that later. But um, we're gonna start with my journey and why this book even came to be. Um, so Adrian, you can go next. I can. You can, perfect. Okay, so basically, Krista Bender, I'm known as the Parisian wine girl. I've pretty much created this alter ego um, in Paris because the reason that I moved here was because I got accepted to an international sommelier program here in France. And there was only 20 people selected. And so I took that opportunity. I left my corporate job. I was in a very troubled relationship back in California. So that's kind of how the book starts. It's this, there's a thread through the book of not only the International Wine School, there'll be a lot of wine facts, a lot of wine education. That's definitely part of it but it's also coupled with the journey of, of course, the cliche of the road less traveled and a woman moving to Paris, meeting everyone, it's all brand new and just wanting to make it here, right? So that's sort of a theme. I'm gonna read just the back of the book because I think it really encompasses what you're gonna get out of the book in a really just conclusive way. Um, so it says, Paris, my beautiful madness, pulls back the curtain and not only explores Bender's time attending an international sommelier school in Paris, but also the expat world coupled with the Parisian dating scene, which helped her uncover dark and discomfitting truths about how she relates to men. So that's all streamed through. 
Um, so it's sort of like a Sex in the City in Paris <laughs> meets a wine school and all of these adventures that I was fortunate enough to take. Um, so drawing inspiration in equal measure from Anthony Bourdain and Candace Bushnell, Paris, My Beautiful Madness details the highs and lows of a year of self-discovery <coughs> and dreamy brunches in the saint germain de prix to the grit of the wine cellar confidential. And then a quote from Amy Thomas, who is an, an author I adore. She wrote, Paris, my sweet, and Brooklyn in love. She writes, anyone who feels Paris in their bones will love the experiences Krista Bender shares in the pages of Paris, My Beautiful Madness. By turn, seductive, sweet, and shocking. It's a story of desire, determination, and always following your dreams. Next. <laughs> okay, so to start, I kind of, I kind of went on the, the note of I was unhappy in California in a very corporate, dysfunctional work environment. My relationship was a long-term troubled situation. So I kind of did a little week to myself where I went to Patricia Wells Cooking School in Provence. I don't know who's familiar with Patricia Wells. All of us Everybody. are familiar with Patricia Wells. <laughs> so I met her and I spent a week with her in Provence. And I sat across the table from her and I was sort of telling her, okay, I got accepted to this sommelier school, but I have to leave everything. It's a huge risk. I'm making a great salary. I'm living in Los Angeles. I have a great title, all of the things, right? You're in corporate, you're moving up. But should I go, should I do this? I feel like I'm too old to do it. And she just sat there and she, I didn't really recall her turning to look at me across the table and saying, go to Paris. If you even have to ask yourself, should I go? You don't deserve to. The answer is an absolute yes, next. And here's pictures of my time in Provence with Patricia. That's her and I. And she was also very good friends with Julia Child. So here's Julia and Patricia. And this trip to Provence really was the nail in the coffin for my whole Parisian ex experience adventure and, and the fact that now I've spent a lot of time was, in living what, in Was the course in Vaison La Romaine? Yes. A little tiny yes. village, right? Gorgeous, um, yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous village. So that time was very special and it just kind of sealed the deal. And then Julia Child gave Patricia one of her stoves. And so there I am cooking on the stove. And I just remember this moment was the moment where I decided that I wasn't gonna live the traditional route. I was going to leave my relationship, leave my job and follow um, the wisdom of Patricia Wells. So that's what I can remember. What did you see. say? Oh, 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 okay. I thought so she said sorry. something about sex. No, keep telling me. Okay. <laughs> what I heard was something about sex. <laughs> so, hey guys, yeah, if you can't hear me, please interrupt me because that's not fun for anyone. So, okay. You so just have, you just, uh, because yeah. of the noise, yes. and, and I'm sorry, but otherwise, if we close these windows, everybody's going to be unhappy. I know. Okay. So. Perfect. Next. We're no? moving on. So, I did accept that invitation to wine school, and... This, <laughs> this was the first statement pr from my professor. He was very dapper. I still know him to this day. I've changed, by the way, all the names in the book because to protect everyone's privacy. So it says Levine, that is not his real name, uh, but we're going with it. But he entered the room. He was wearing a Gucci suit with an Hermes belt. He was the most sophisticated man. He's a, one of the, a master sommelier in Paris. And he said, wine has a place at the table. We are gonna be experts at expressing the emotion and the sentiment of a wine to allow others to enjoy the pleasures of the mouth. And I'm just gonna, you can go to the next slide to show them this. Is that him? Yes, this was our first day of class. And he's Monsieur pouring Lavigne? wine already. <laughs> Lavigne, Laurent Lavigne, that's his name in the book. <laughs> so everyone has different names. They're all characters. I just, they all still live in Paris, so I don't want to give away um, too many people <laughs> and their information. But so I go on to say in the book, this was said in French as an opening statement and quickly translated by Mr. Porter. The entire course would be taught in French, then translated into English. I was captivated. Professor Levine went on to recite a few more poetic sentences about wine. I didn't know I could feel so consumed and taken with words, and I suddenly realized with great affirmation, wine was a Latin passion for me. I sat listening intently to the entire class. Next, that class ended with these people pouring us 
glasses of Louis Roeder champagne. So my journey at this point, even the first week, I was I said this is going to be spectacular. Okay, because in France. They didn't advertise this. In America, it would have been, all of this would have been advertised for people to pay money and all of this. Everyone was selective. We knew it was a very special thing we were about to embark on, but none of the luxury, none of the chateau names, nothing that we actually experienced was ever promoted when I first made the decision to do this course. So I started a very loose blog. It was called Pastry in Paris, just to document all the houses we were going to, all of the experiences we were having, because I couldn't believe it. It was something, it was cinematic at that moment to me. I just said, someone has to, has to capture this, you know? And so that was a very loose blog, mainly for friends and family, but it really helped me, and I couldn't see this at the time, but that's how this memoir also has so much juicy information and has also all the factual information of certain wines that I would highly recommend, certain appellations, certain places, chateaus, all of that. So there's a lot of wine facts in here. So if you if you love wine, you'll love the book. If you love Paris, you'll love the book. If you love France, you'll love the book. And if you just want drama and entertainment, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> so arriving through the entrance of the Louis Roder mansion was definitely a tough experience for me. Another butler dressed in a tuxedo greeted me with a bottle of champagne, a glass of Cristal, vintage 2006, madame. This was the treatment of someone with great power and standing. I had never experienced anything like it. So Professor Levine had connections that are, that are just astounding. So we did get to go into private chef-paired meals with, in private cellars, tasting vintages they pulled out that you know, no one really gets to experience. So that, this was also part of our program. Okay, next. Um, and there's our pouring and people pouring next. Okay, so here's our wine school. So not so so the lectures were based in Paris. It was all taught in French, as I said, and then translated into English. There was 20 students, six of them French, but all of us moved to Paris at the same time. So in addition to going to all of the wine regions, we also were expected as part of our curriculum to go into Paris to private private wine tastings on a weekly basis. We had three a week, things like this, where we just had a badge, we'd go in. It was absolutely, we were not even sommeliers yet, but we were going in with some of the greatest sommeliers in the world. Um, events held at the you know Four Seasons in Paris, private tastings, we were getting to experience it all. And at this point, we were consumed with wine. I. I know by the end of the course we have Is that a pun? <laughs> <laughs> we have tasted, I believe, five thousand wine. Oh. And when I say when I say tasted, like analyzed, you know, like vintage, when was this grown? Smell it, okay, write notes, that kind of thing. It was so intense. We were living and breathing this life. You can go next. So Okay, not only, so then we become, now now three days into our class, I think it was like the first week, if yeah, I recall. Second week. Okay, when we went out to Bordeaux. Yeah. So none of this again is advertised. Professor Levine walks in the classroom. It's just so French to me, it's so funny. Um, and he goes, hi, everyone get ready. Here's train tickets. You are all each individually going out to a chateau in Bordeaux. They don't speak English. You will live there two weeks. So that, yes, so, and we didn't go together. Everyone had to go, we all took the train together and then we were picked up by a stranger, we don't know, and taken into, I, I'll share my pictures and stuff coming up, but we just, we didn't even know what was going on. You know, they just picked us up and then we're just shipped out there and we're learning and it was part of the curriculum. So I write, Chateau Gayard was painted above the doors in large red lettering. This would be my home for two weeks. I glanced up at the arched windows, stucco walls, and terracotta roof tiles and felt a little bit like I was in a movie. And that's a French, um, that means in, in English, life is too short to drink bad wine. You can go next. <laughs> that's my chateau and the next. And basically this. Where, where was it? Near Bordeaux? It's saint Emilion. Oh, saint Emilion. So, right. saint Emilion. I was picked up by the train station by a woman named Katrine. She actually owns four Grand Cru vineyards in saint Emilion. 
I was taken, I spoke no French at this time because I had just practically arrived and was dropped in Paris. I had none of my classmates at this time with me. And this is, this is all beautiful because it really forced me and there's so much information about it in the book, about the journey of it, about the foreignness. I had a huge nightmare the first night I was there because I was in this by myself. They all left. And they we're in like a little village and everyone left all the winemakers, even the owners, you can go next. This was my entrance and then I was in this chateau. So we're talking kind of a little bit under the Tuscan sun, but in Bordeaux. <laughs> and I had just miles of vineyards. No, you couldn't even see another building, you know? So I'm there all by myself for two weeks every night and then all the winemakers arrive in the morning. So, but it was so amazing because, you can go next. There's so, to really quickly, there's a classification system. Does everyone drink wine, most people in here? Do you guys, have you traveled to wine regions in France? Yeah. Okay, so everyone's very adept at this. So basically there's a classification system to mark quality. saint is a region known for having great terroir and producing wonderful wines. However, also important obviously is the winemaker's skill and ability to produce a great wine. Katrine, who I learned from, had been awarded Grand Cru for all four of her vineyards. Next. So here's a little, just if anyone's not familiar, Bordeaux is its own animal, to be honest. So I'm not really going to break that down. Um, but just <laughs> in general, you start regional, you go village, premier crew, grand crew. So you can see there's a very small um, percentage. And so she had all of the grand crew. So next, um, this is saint Emilion. I'm sure most people have been there, right? And go next. And here's my experience. So I was these the enologists, and then I was with the people making the wine every day, checking the pH levels, going out. Actually, we did a machine harvest, um, but then I would sort the grapes, and then we'd go into the cellar and actually to get all the fermentation going and monitor all of that. So I was doing this on a daily basis. Our days were about 12 hours a day, but we would stop for, of course, a two-hour lunch. It was you know multiple courses, and then I met all of these people. There are changed names in the book, but that's Cedric and Claire. And then this is sort of, um, I made all these friends. And then this gentleman was pursuing me at the time. He owned a vineyard in Bordeaux. And so that was, that's all in the book. The whole experience with them, plus all of the wine bags and all. The middle here. photo, those are grapes being crushed? Yes. So that's why we I see. Put them I in. can't help but see Ethel and Lucy. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get our feet in it. <laughs> that was not happening. Stomping on the grapes. <laughs> okay. Next. next. Shall I go next? Yeah. Next. <laughs> so these are just more pictures of our daily life out on the vineyard. Yeah, that's true. Um, and just measuring that Cedric, the analogist. Wow. Next. And then that's Professor Levine. And he closed down a restaurant in St. Emilion on our last night, and we finally were all able to come together and talk about our experiences and have a very comforting moment at that <coughs> point. And my experience was pretty luxury. I was, I was, Cedric and Claire took me to their little home. We went to vineyards. We had oysters and wine paired and all this, all the weekends. But my classmates, some of them, because you never knew where you were going, some of them went, they were sleeping on cots, taking communal showers. They felt like slave workers, right? So my experience, it just, it didn't, we didn't know. And so a lot of my girlfriends from class were, it was really hard on them. You know, not only is it so foreign, no one's speaking English, and then you're going out to the real grit of Bordeaux winemaking. And that really- time, did you have to speak English or French? I had to really speak French because they were not speaking English. So, I mean, there was little bits and pieces, but it was two weeks of being immersed. While I knew I was in a course, I had to pass this, you know, and get a good review. That in itself could have cost you a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> An immersion course. Yes. But and we didn't yeah. know that at the time. So it was just very all new to us. And um, yeah, so your, Bordeaux your, wine your, yeah. your classmates were all scattered around different vineyards in, in yeah, not even just St. Emilion. Some were in Madoc, some were, it just all over Bordeaux. Basically, he, my professor has connections all over every region, so he basically has, knows who's safe to send someone. How, how long was the course? The course was um, in total 10 months, and so we did a Bordeaux. It's a, yeah, it's a serious course. 
10, and it was very intense because, like I said, we had a five-hour lecture every day in class where we were already tasting. We obviously spit the wine because you can't be doing this. We were actually sick by the end just from tasting and spitting. Then we go to the event. Then we did all the wine region tours, which I'll get into, where we were going to Louis Roederer and all the Bordeaux chateaus. Then we did this stint, and then there's another part of the, of the program that I'm going to get into that was a complete complete movie set. So what's the curriculum? I mean, like, you just, clearly the first week you're already in a vineyard. Yeah. So basically we arrive, day one you s you're introduced to what you're going to be doing. You're going to be working events in Paris, you're going to be required to be at tastings three nights a week in Paris. We're going to taste, we're going to go through France and all the regions and every day taste a minimum of five to six wines, analyze. We started out with smelling like he'd bring in a box of all different smells and we'd start blind smelling to see if we could pick it up and then try and try and match that to wines we were smelling. So it's muscle memory. So he was training at, we're, we were trained to be sommeliers, which I'm gonna get into in the later part of this. But at the end, we were able, and it was absolutely astonishing because none of us really knew anything when we got there other than we loved wine in France. But we were able to be poured a wine. It was our final exam, actually. Without any information, we could, we should be able to tell you what is the vintage year? What is the grape varietal? Is it a French wine or not? Where is the appellation? What are the grapes? Is it a blend? What's the percentage of alcohol? What is the year and what is the approximate price? Wow. <laughs> wow. So. <laughs> That was our test, yeah. Wow. So not we didn't get it right, obviously, all of those things all of the time. But, <laughs> but top sommeliers in the world do, you know? And so we were on our way. And so I found the, the best part through it was then we would all go, because we were wine geeks at that time, we could go to any restaurant in Paris and know exactly what's a good value, what's a good deal, what was a good vintage, what wine we want, what's going to pair with this. What, we were literally experts probably within three months. Sorry. Three months. Yeah. We were already at that level. Yeah. Okay, next. So, and here's just a little, basically because we're talking about Bordeaux, you can see obviously all of you know, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence on wine regions in France, but it's <laughs> in the Southwest, there's the main grapes grown are Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Semillon, and Muscadet. There's also allowed a little bit of Petit Verdot and Malbec in Bordeaux, but those aren't listed. Um, but there's, you know, there's very strict laws in France, as I'm sure all of you know. And so I just got firsthand to really see how that operates. I even remember a day when it was very scary and Katrina and Cedric were in a very big debate in French. I could understand what they were doing, but they had to bring in a van of people from Spain because the grapes had to be picked or else they were going to lose their entire crop. Oh, so geez. they brought people across the border to go out the next day and get all of them out because the rain was coming. So they couldn't have that happen. So anyway, moving on. So now with all of this, it sounds so dreamy and luxurious and all things, but there was also a time in Paris that there was an actual world emergency. So at the beginning of this chapter, I write, Champagne is a solemn spiritual place, a place of great religious and historic significance. Indeed, for all its joyfulness as a wine, the region itself has been continually torn apart by tragedy, especially during World War I and II when it was a gruesome battlefield. As a result, there's a soulfulness here, that's as palpable as the dazzling bubbles in every glass you have. And keywords here are tragedy and gruesome battlefield. So next, this starts a chapter where I write, at 10.35 p.m. I check my phone while scrunched up in the movie theater chair. I was on a date. Benjamin's hand resting on my thigh. Feeling the panic seep in, I scrolled up to the beginning of the message stream. Paris is under attack. So this was when the Bataclan concert hall terrorist attacks were happening. So we had been in Paris a total of two months. We had just gotten back from our Bordeaux internships, and this happened in Paris right at that November time. 13th. November uh, 2015. Yeah. So there, yeah, so there was shootings um, all down the 9th and 10th in the cafes and those around the small and at the concert hall. So Paris, it was a very tragic time. Was anyone 
Everyone here. Who was here? I was here. You were here. <laughs> and the streets, it was eerie. It was just so sad. Um, and obviously a huge tragedy for everyone involved. And then it was also, I write in the book, the parallels between 9-11 and the States and how I felt here in France during something like that. So that's all kind of in here. And just the fact of, again, we're living like it's just a paradigm because we're living like this luxury and all this wine and then there's like this huge emergency they're closing the border to france and we're all you know it's just only adding to the drama so go ahead okay next so this okay so i told you there's one other aspect of this wine program so this was that not only did we have to go to Bordeaux and do all of that and then all the tastings and whatever, but we were also expected to do an internship at a fine dining Michelin star restaurant in Paris under the sommelier and be doing and that was a six week course. So my interview, we had to interview for it too, and it was very competitive. Um, so do you remember Citrus Etoile in the 8th arrondissement? It has since closed. Citrus Etoile, it's right by the Cartier, yeah, it's the, by the Arc yeah, de Triomphe. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I was very sorry to see close. Yes, it was amazing. And so during my first interview, the sommelier said this to me, Krista, I expect that you will dress like a glamour girl every night. By this, I mean dressing sexy, walking seductively, high heels, makeup, and tight outfits. Mm -hmm. So I was clearly, like, I'm in a school program, but this is also now what I'm going to be prepared to do. So you can go next. Could I ask you, was there this, was this the American co-owner from the wife of the uh, chef who hosted that? No. Okay. It was the French sommelier and general manager. Really? Yes. But Elizabeth, oh, sorry, Meredith, <laughs> um, is right here, yeah. who you're talking about. And so she, I became very close with her. She's from California. So the funny story with her is she is married, she was married to the chef um, in the book. His name is Gabrielle. And she was in LA dating Richard Gere on a date. And the chef came out to the table because it's Richard Gere. So he was you know, presenting and doing all the touching of the table. And she said they locked eyes. And she left Richard Gere for Gabrielle Epi and then whisked away to Paris. <laughs> so, so yeah, I believe it's true. I mean. <laughs> anyway, so she was a character, and that's also a very entertaining part of this book. She was just <laughs> out there, and I really document a lot of stuff going on. And then that sommelier and general manager was also absolutely, I mean, that in itself, these two people had so much content for me. Um, so anyway, I worked in this fine dining restaurant, had to speak French to the clients, had to present wine as a sommelier, and had to dress and things like this every single night. And I, I made so many mistakes, it was so uncomfortable. Like In the beginning especially, even though I knew what I was talking about at that point, for example, I couldn't find my corkscrew, so Antoine, that's his name in the book, of course, he sent me with his, and it was some really nice modern one. So I'm sitting at the table with a middle-aged French couple, and they're just staring at me. Unbelievable! They couldn't believe I was even working there because I couldn't <laughs> do it, you know. And I'm like Antoine, so I go back with my tail between my legs, and he's just like, "It's fine." When he goes out and opens the <laughs> bottle, just little things like that. I dropped a glass of champagne all over the front of the kitchen line one night, like a shattered tray of them. Um, so <laughs> that was really fun. Um, but anyway, this was six weeks long. It was pretty intense and something I absolutely had to pass to get through the program. But I will, it, it gave me so much confidence after. By the, by the end of the six weeks, I was like, okay, if I could do that in Paris, I feel pretty confident anywhere else, right, in the world to be able to talk about wine. Okay, and then also during that time, I was really actively dating Parisian men. And so there's just a lot of, um, it's a self-discovery for me. And I think I read in the beginning on the back of the book just um, that I was going through some self-worth stuff and as a woman and just, there's all of that in there. And so this was, here I was in a black dress and fur. It was a Saturday night in Paris. We literally pulled up in front of a neighborhood Indian restaurant in the outskirts of the city. Taj Mahal flashed into neon sign above the restaurant. 
at this point, someone would have had to convince me I was still in Paris. So dating Parisian men was quite an experience for me, and I write a lot about it in here, just the difference. Good or bad? <laughs> I mean, I, I was so... I'm mesmerized by them, but I also kind of call them like alien. You know, I don't know if anyone is a Parisian male in here. <laughs> you're Parisian, <laughs> but you're a female, so, <laughs> so you're, okay. you're fine. But anyway, um, yeah, it was just very interesting and a whole journey for me. And I really wanted a French boyfriend, just to be honest. I really like saw myself having that life here, and so that's all in the book too. Just my whole life doing this so we can that's all those wine bottles that you, <laughs> you hear that out there that you've been drinking <laughs> okay. next is am i speaking loud enough by the way is it fine okay Maybe a bit. this oh, this, this side this side needs turn, you more turn this way sure as can long everyone as see it okay okay um so i oh and then the other theme strewn through the book, and I don't know if anyone else can relate to this, but I was it was very clear to me and always stated that it'll be really hard for you to actually live here, right? You're not gonna make, you're, you'll, you're here for a little bit, but you're gonna go back. And so even a woman at a chocolate shop, I'll never forget it. She was married to a man in Santa Monica, she's French, and she moved back because she missed France so much and he didn't wanna come back with her. And so she divorced him, and she said, you will see eventually, you will move back, you'll come to realize where you identify. Would I move back? I didn't want to. I felt so certain I wasn't meant to leave Paris. And so I have this internal struggle, and I never wanted to leave, and I always felt that I just identified more actually with France than I did in California. I always, I didn't, people are like, don't you miss your family? Don't you miss? Yes, I do, but I really am happiest here. You know, I feel like a soul connection here. And so that, it, it goes through a theme in the book of me fighting it because there's characters in the book. Sebastian is Stanley in the book. He was one of my best friends. He kind of saw Paris the way I did. And Sebastian, Stanley now li has lived here eight years. And Samantha, Sarah, is our other friend in the book. And she was very prideful of us being American. And this is fun, and this is a sabbatical, but we're going back where the taxes don't suck, and I'm, you know, I'm leaving. I'm going back to America. So basically, her and I had some deep conversations throughout the book about me fighting that notion and wanting myself to have an international lifestyle and feeling like you can make it here, and it's all how you think of it, right? And if your thoughts believe that it can happen, why not? So, next. So, okay, so that, those themes are throughout the book. There's a lot of juicy things in the book. And then the final sommelier exam is my favorite chapter of the book. It's chapter 20. I think that it's just very suspenseful. And this is part of it. I stared at the wine, not the judges. Wine was calming me on all fronts at the moment. I took it up to my nose again. This time I was able to identify which fruits. The smell of apricots was overwhelming. Fresh, juicy peaches like a basket full from picking them up off the grass in the countryside landscape in France. Next. So basically, as I was saying, this is kind of what we would do on a daily basis. We would be blind poured wine and we'd be analyzing it all the time and really we were really good at basically knowing what it was without anyone telling us. So on the final exam, they poured one red, one, they did this first, we had to write essays about each one. That was the written part. The second part was you had to stand up in front of eight Parisian sommeliers and they would pour one red and one white and you talked for three minutes analyzing it on the spot and called the wine. Um, and this was all being graded, so you didn't have time. It was timed. You, we didn't have any time to think about it. And then there was also parts of the exam where we had to open things, decant, light candles, get all the sediment out of the bottles, all of that. Um, so we were. It was just multifaceted. But anyway, this was our final sign-off to becoming French sommeliers and making it in the wine world. Next, and so um, next. There's oh, like a whole the legs, you know, huh? The legs. Oh, the legs. To, do you want yes. me to go past the legs? Yes, well, <laughs> because the next part. So I was, yeah. This was when I was gonna do like a whole wine. I didn't know there would be this many people. So I was gonna originally lead a few people through an actual analysis of wine. 
But basically, we were learning, there's not even just one aroma you're smelling, there's primary, secondary, tertiary aromas. So you do all of that in your analysis to the judges. You also are talking about viscosity, you're talking about the visual characters, why you're calling a wine based on the visual side of it, the aromas, and then of course the taste. So that was all included in all of our training. Um, okay, so Sebastian. So we basically, at the end of um, no, wait, 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 wait. Stanley in the book is Sebastian. Yes. Is that it? That's okay. Sorry. Just okay, got it. it. Yeah. Because so <laughs> I changed all of their names, but he's he's painted in a very good light, so he's he's okay <laughs> with me stating that. That's Stanley's him. okay. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> so anyway, at the end of our class, we all bonded, obviously, very intently, but. He said, may your light shine wherever you go in this world. May this year be the best harvest of your grape ever. May the memories that were nothing but remarkable stay with you from our time here in Paris in France. Sante. With that, we all clinked our glasses. And at that point, I vowed to myself I would not lose the option and determination of making life extraordinary. Not good, not even just great. Extraordinary. So, You lost I me. Think because of the I'm so traffic. sorry. It was a quote by Stanley, a beautiful quote. Just here it is. Can you see it? Well, at the end, I say with that, can you, there's our class. This is our class. We're missing a couple people. Mm -hmm. I think so. Anyway, that's us. Okay, so that's the last part of that. But then, okay, remember, so there's a theme. I have to stay in Paris. I'm like a dog with a bone about it. I'm like, okay, because the, the theme of the book, too, was we were all in this together, and we all spent 10 months, and we all traveled, and we all moved here and relocated for this. And then what were we going to do? Just go back? Because we had done a high on life, you know? And we're all just supposed to leave and go back to our own country with, yeah, a wine degree. But I just didn't accept that. I said, no, like I came here, I was planning here for a reason, I want to stay. So part of that was I was finding ways to how that could work and happen. So this is also in the book, I will take it. I made this declarative statement from the living room of my charming sixth floor flat with a partial view of the Notre Dame. It was exactly what I had envisioned when I had pictured life in Paris, a true dream. And so there it is. That's just my bedroom. It's kind of blurry. I didn't think it was going to come out like that. But. And then, so I found myself at that point writing an email to the owner of the apartment. This is a shortened version. It's all in the back of the book. But I basically said I love the apartment. I'm looking to buy property in Paris now. If you know of any other properties for sale, that would be great. Please let me know. Merci beaucoup. And I will never forget my stomach dropped. Within 24 hours, she just sent an email. This is the price, period. Because I didn't expect her to sell it. It's a cent, you know, I was just like, this must be meant to be. So then I called Adrian. And then we shot a TV show <laughs> called House Hunters International. And it was called Champagne Problems in Paris. And, and Stanley's in it, too. He was Stanley's my little in guru, it. So Stanley's kind of That's fancy. the crew. Yeah. And then here we are going apartment hunting. And so anyway, I ended up buying that apartment. I still own it. And like I said, I rent it when I don't use it. But I've never regretted it for a minute. Um, I feel like the luckiest person. I know other people probably own places in Paris. But I've never, ever gotten over my love for Paris. So like I said, I'm my... Parisian Wine Girl is my Instagram. I have, a, I have a website with our wine tasting business that I'm going to talk about later because there's a sequel to all of this and how we're making it in Paris. And we started a tour business to Champagne. I went and became a director of a private Champagne club after this school that was based in California. And I planned tours and took people to Champagne for a week at a time. Um, and also imported and did all the marketing for all the Champagne that we were bringing in. And that's what I did with my knowledge. Um, and so I then took that and decided I wanted to do my own business here. And so that is now what we do. And I partnered with Sebastian. 
and <laughs> he has been working in wine in Paris for the last eight years. So with his knowledge and my doing the private champagne club and luxury tours, we have created our own. So we're gonna, we have videos of that and footage because we've had it all documented that I do want to share, but Adrian wants to do a other thing too. Okay, you're back on. There you go. And then do you think we're going to be able to upload the wine videos after, maybe? We're going to try. We're going to try. Okay. <laughs> we're going to try. Okay. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, I'm here to answer anything about Paris, apartments. What, what did you, the job did you leave in LA? What did you give up with? That's a good question. I was um, repeat repeat the question just because okay. she's not my up. The question up. was, what did I leave in LA when I made the decision to move to Paris? I was working. It was actually a very. It sounds really good. It was a key innovation chef because I went to culinary school in San Francisco after college and got my culinary degree. Which actually I did that because I took a trip to Paris and fell in love with French food and wine, cuisine, how they viewed food as an art, all of that. So I went to culinary school directly after that. I was going to go be accountant for my dad's company, but I said, no, I'm going to go to culinary school to bring me closer to France. Again, I didn't know how that would work. After that, I got a job as a chef in LA, but it was an innovation chef. So I was creating recipes for mass production so for you know like the frozen little appetizers and whole foods yeah. things like that so I was in the test kitchens doing all that then I would fly out to the headquarters and um, present my recipes and then if they bought it great then we would find a factory to mass produce it but the problem with it was and I write about it in the book that I went to culinary school I respected chef I respected the markets in France and all of the freshness and what I was then doing was I was taking everything I knew how to do in French cooking and then figuring out how we could produce it in a factory, which meant adding a chemical, adding a preservative, mm -hmm. taking away natural ingredients. So I was having an amazing salary. I was being flown all over America to meet. I was basically meeting with food buyers and presenting recipes. It was a very cool job. But I, in my soul, I was like, but this is, against not right what I <laughs> want to represent and fresh quality and food and right so I mean that's really what they have to do they have yes, to take all and this and then you go find a factory and, and then you have you to add chemicals and preservatives yeah, and, and all that stuff and then produce. so that's what I was doing and I write about it very briefly in the book I hired a very good editor for this book out of New York because I wrote it and I've, I've always found writing came so naturally to me and I've kept blogs and all of that um, but I wanted it to be really well streamlined and put together and themes throughout it so that I could present it like this and be proud of it um, but so I hired someone and um, she made she I had I rewrote this manuscript ten times I, I have changed the manuscript from the original manuscript 10 times to make it what it is for the strongest message. So we cut down the beginning of the book, which was a lot about that and about just the, just the whole part of LA was probably three chapters long. She was like, nope, that's going to be a chapter at the most and we're going right into France, you know? So things like Nobody that. cares about L.A. Nobody cares about, <laughs> yeah, nobody cares about all LA. of these things going on and the <laughs> chemicals you were putting in. So um, <laughs> anyway, that, yeah, that's a good question. But can that's I, what I left. Can I ask you, uh, yeah. kind of related to that, now you, had a, you just revealed that you had a culinary background yes. before you uh, did the Clemente report. One of the things that's always impressed me is I've understood the role of a sommelier. Mm -hmm working with the chef who's preparing the meals for the evening yes. in the restaurant and trying to figure out what pairings work and don't work with right. the wines that are on the list so you can make the right recommendation. Yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the training that you had, yes. if you had any, yes. in the sommelier course and how you found that, like a petite place, you know, in terms of actual on-the-job experience. Yes. How, did you, how did that work? Yeah, 
great question. So <coughs> we did have food and wine training in the course. We attended nine total where there was a chef coming and our professor would pour the six wines and we would taste the food next to the wine together. So we learned all of the factual things about how the chemicals work and how things work and all of the details of how to pair wine and food. So I would say probably once a month it was different themes. So it was, okay, we're going to do burgundy only, red and white. You guys are coming to a tasting tonight. Be there at nine. It's going to last three hours. And we'd just be presented little plates of food and take our notes about why it's pairing. So obviously there's there's very traditional ones like Sautern and Roquefort. The reason we're doing that is because Sautern has a sweetness, the Roquefort has the saltiness, but they're both so rich. So you're now gonna have a richness on your palate with sweet salt. And people would never think that, but it, if you do it, it's like a match made in heaven on mm. your palate. So we learned all of that. And there's, t there's typical things that I'm sure most people have heard, white wine with fish and chicken, red, whatever, but we went way beyond that. Why are we doing that? What sauce? Where's the acidity level? If we have, if a chef presents me with a dish with a certain acidity and we take a bite, we should know exactly. Are we pairing a Sauvignon Blanc with it, a Chardonnay, a Chenin Blanc, or are we gonna pair a Roussan Mars Blanc from the Rhone Valley with it, and why? Because of the level of acidity or because of the, the richness going on. So I write about that in the book in a little bit, and also, cheese and wine and it's not necessarily it's hard to pair cheese with wine actually because wine is acidic so we went through an entire course of just cheeses being presented by Bartholomew and just every kind of wine that would actually go so then you had to learn about cheese yes very hard <laughs> that, job we had that's a whole new conversation <laughs> But that was, oh, our, yeah. wasn't that one of your favorite parts? It I mean, everything fun. was amazing. Had like we had really so good. many dishes and professional chefs coming to this mm -hmm. and doing it with us. And then our Psalm professors talking about it, but then calling us out. So also part of this whole program was very Socratic. It was on the spot. Like our professor would just say, Krista, please stand up, give us your pairing, give us the reasons things like that. Once we had a gist of it, we were then put on the spot to call it because this world is like that, especially if you want to make it in France. It's taken very seriously and you have to know exactly what you're doing and you have to have it in your head. You can't, it can't be your reading about it. So let me ask you, if you were to get a job in the U.S., would they recognize your accreditation? That's such a good <laughs> question and that's in the book and I'm going to talk about it because this was part of the theme of what are we doing now? Because the six people that were French in our class were automatically placed by a professor in, who went to La Tour Argent? Uh, Toussaint. Suzanne went to La Tour Argent, really Michelin star restaurants, Le Clément. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so because of the network, of our, the network of our professor, but the French were immediately placed. Why? Because they can legally work here. They're going right yeah. away. Mm -hmm. So the rest of us cannot. We had to deal with a visa. And why are they going to hire me over a French person, mm -hmm. right? They're not. So basically, that was a huge part of the dilemma is that we just did all of this. We are on a high. We learned so much and is that recognized in America so what I did was I realized it's really not people are gonna in my interview go this is amazing you studied in France oh tell me about it but is it gonna get me a position so what I did is I then moved back and I went through the court of master sommelier in Napa and got my level one certification so that I could at least have credibility in California and in the US yeah, when, when but heard, this program greatly helped me, right? Sorry to interrupt I'm sorry, you. I'm sorry, I want to pick up on this a little bit because the, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the leading French contender for the best sommelier in the world this year was a woman who was actually practicing the craft in the U.S. I think she's from New York. And yeah. I mean, you may know who I'm talking about. Yeah, so because the, the master, so there's, there's levels in the master court. There's a different affiliate program also. Yeah. Well, there's, so it's level one, then there's 
um, level two, which is certified. Level three is advanced. And there's only of advanced, I think, 230 in the world. 56 wow. now. Okay. 256. 256. There's a new Korean girl just got it in like two. So, exactly. So, this degree that we got. That's yes, hard. if you yeah. have, <laughs> if you have Laurent Levine writing you a letter, yes, you'll get into Michelin star restaurants in Paris if you're French. Um, but you, the French are not even, I mean, this was. The French are not going to hire an American to be their not. sommelier Absolutely in not. their French restaurants. No. It's mm -hmm. not going to happen. Ever. It's not going right. to happen. So this was right. part I they did. Couldn't. I did. They don't trust us no. to have a talk. No. Just, like, but why would they take that away decided. also from a French citizen? No. Right? Why are we? Yeah, they're not doing that. So anyway, that was part of my dilemma is that I had all of this knowledge and then I really had to figure out what I was going to do. I don't know. Because I, I didn't want to lose it. I didn't want to lose the credibility. I'm so waiting. that's what I did. I went and got my master court just to have that you know, oh as a safety uh, net of like, this is what I did. And I'm oh. actually certified out of a, a real Oh, good idea. Program. Okay. 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 Correct. We'll see. How do you arrive at this absolute definition for a particular one? That's such a good question. So the question was, not everyone has the same perception when you taste and smell a wine. We're all different. We all like different things. Um, so we were trained. It started with, okay, so I would say, so we were trained first on aroma. Like he brought in all of these scents and that's said every, yeah, that's 200 yeah. aromas. Because in wine, there will be 200. It's, absolutely incredible because I kind of went over tertiary, primary, secondary aromas. There will be, and it also matters if it's sans aeration or with aeration when you're going to get aroma. So we were also trained when we're going to score our, our glass when we're not because it's key in the beginning to have your aroma without any aeration on the wine to be able to call the wine. <coughs> if you have any air going, you know, when you do this, it changes the aroma, but you need the first aroma, what was the original aroma first. Is that why they smell, do you need to smell corks all the time when they remove them? Well, you smell corks usually to see if it's bouchonnet, which means if it's a corked Cork. wine, you can t you can tell that before you even ever taste it. All of us can tell just by smelling a cork if it's <laughs> if it's a rancid wine or not, which is another, basically it's, it's part of the tree bark and all of that, but it happens. I don't know the statistic, but probably one out of every 20 bottles. We just went to lunch the other day, and immediately I smelled it, didn't even taste it. I was like, this is forked. Thank you. So anyway, but um, <laughs> but the French respect that, honestly, when you pick that up, because everyone knows that in the restaurant industry, and it's just part of the thing. Did I answer your, sorry, did I answer your question? Kind of, sort of, but oh, I didn't, okay, about. sorry. <laughs> so, and then like everyone has different tastes in all of this. I would just say with our training, it was also because we tasted so many wines. And for example, if we are going into Cornas in the Rhone Valley, we would maybe taste a hundred, right? So we knew the profiles. And even if people had a different palate, you tasted it till you understood that that is a Cornos, that's from that appellation, that is only Syrah, that doesn't have Grenache in it, you know? So we just, it, we kept repeatedly having these tastings so that we could get it and people that maybe weren't understanding it, our professor would spend more time with them to really get them to realize and recognize it. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to do though yeah. because and everyone likes different things and still to this day Stanley and I go out all the time and it's hard for us to decide on what wine we want because we have different tastes. He likes more refined, light, burgundy. Well, it also style. depends on the food. That's it, it, when it does. Comes to yeah, yeah. Wine well, we, yeah. it's yeah, it's, it's a whole important thing. Too. I think as a sommelier, I think the most important part of being a good sommelier is to be able to listen to the customer what they're having as food yeah. tonight. So to, to choose the right wine for the right food. So that's what we try to. Well, I mean, we learn a lot from the course, but also. Yeah, uh, we both love cooking, so we have we do a lot of study on our uh, on, on the side as well. Experience a lot of different types of pairing and wine. 
And a lot of the, in French, wine is really meant to be paired with food because it changes. The, it's so delicious. It's part of the meal. And so that's why it's so crucial and that's why it's such a big part of their culture is because it's really seen as, as an, it's just part of the meal. It's yeah. going to enhance your experience. So if you don't want to do a 10-month course, <laughs> what get, you know, what's the short version? Yeah, is a yeah, shorter version, the short version that we recommend for some of us who want to get a little bit better than just basic knowledge? We have a We have company. a tasting, like a yeah. hours, like a quick one. Anyway, like we have different course. ones. We do events. We did a six-hour event in a garden in the 14th or on B Small. Where we, the video. I want her to show the videos, yeah. It, where we basically, we Should pick I, a Okay, theme. should I try to see if this is going to work first? If you can, I mean, are you, are you serious? Look. So I made the decision to wow. leave my career. Sorry, guys. Yeah. But we can continue. Yeah, these are free. I owned a property in California that I had to sell to be able to fund the Paris property. And then the Great Varietal itself. So it's terroir, climate, ripeness, and when that winemaker decides to pick it, then that's one part of it. Then you're going into the cellar. Some winemakers are barrel aging it for a certain amount of time. Some winemakers are doing malolactic fermentation, which malolactic fermentation, it's a secondary fermentation where you're basically, I'm gonna give you simple terms. You're changing the malic acid into lactic. You're making it a creamier on your palate. So basically some winemakers make the decision to do that, some don't. Um, depending on the wine and how they have, they feel it's tasting as it's developing in the fermentation. So it's a secondary fermentation that you can do to make the wine have more buttery, lactic quality. So Chardonnays, some people, you know, you can experience a lot of butter if you're having a Chardonnay or something like that. Some Chardonnays don't have that. And so they're more fruity. They're on the fruitier side. They're on the more citrus side. So there's all these little nuances that you can do, but it starts at the terroir, it starts at the ripeness at a scientific level. It starts with the climate and actually where the grape is grown, and then it, it goes into, and also what kind of barrels. Are they using wood chips? Are they using different things to add, like vanilla notes, or hickory notes, or smokiness? In France, it's really, you can't really add anything, but you can barrel age it in certain barrel mm. wood, different woods and things like that. Yeah. No. But I this would, is what we want. If I wanted a woody taste, I picture somebody taking a, a slice of live oak. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right. It's a video on your computer. Yeah, not they're not video. putting peaches. Where do you get that? Yeah, they're not. You're getting it from the ground? from the terroir oh, and the root, yeah, yeah, and the sun on it. So obviously, if we're drinking a white wine out of the Rhone Valley, which is south, compared to a white wine in Chablis area of Burgundy, we're gonna get a very different flavor because of where it's grown. So that white wine down there, it's still, it's, they're both still very rich wine, but the fruit notes are gonna be completely different. What do you like? Okay. <laughs> well, a lot of it, a lot yeah. of it has to do with the fact that it's assembled. We don't have like a fairy godmother. No, and there's no peaches being <laughs> added. <and nothing. laughs> there's not, there's not licorice being put in the wine as it's fermenting to give it the licorice. Like, Christmas, the expert. But my understanding is that a lot of the, and this is part of the wine. Maker, this is the twenty percent. The wine maker yeah. figuring out, you know, uh, with an assemblage of different grape variety, what it is he or she is looking for as the final, the final set of mm -hmm. notes. And they don't, it's not really a set of, it's not really a case of adding something to sort of to trick out a certain flavor, but it is trying to come up with something that's going to be consistent and noteworthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that I think in some cases reflects the terroir. So if you're in a chalky soil, mm -hmm. you exactly. want actually some of that chalk to come out the aroma as well as the taste. That's a good point. And speaking of chalk, in Champagne, so the first Champagne house we went to with Professor Levine 
was Ulysse Colon. Has anyone had Ulysse Colon? No. Highly recommend Ulysse Super Colon. Now. So hard Super, to get a bottle. It's very hard, so sorry for putting this in your head. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, the reason I'm bringing this up is because his soil, he barely has to even touch the champagne. His soil is, there's so much chalk going down so deep that when you drink that champagne, you get, you get this chalkiness that is, it's a good thing. It's such a positive thing when you're, when the, when the champagne is coming up into your aroma because of his soil, you know? He doesn't do much to it, but it's completely a different experience than drinking a champagne that might not be being grown in as good as a little two acre plot that he has, just based on that, what's in the ground. That's why it's also very important, like when <laughs> it comes to like selecting your bottle to pay attention to the age of the vine of their grapes, because the older the vine usually, it, the, the root actually digs deeper into the soil, so mm -hmm. they extract a little bit more nutrient and minerals into the grapes. Yeah. So usually old vine, if we talk about old vine, usually gives a better one. And also it's the positioning on the slope of the, of the vine because if they're positioned a certain way, not only is, it, is the sunlight affecting it, but they have to work harder. The vines have to work harder so for, to maintain and grow the grape. If they have to work harder, that ups the quality too. So little things like that. It's literally terroir. The French are, with wine, it's seriously about it. It's going to give you the result. Excuse me, we have a question. Yes. Yeah, the balcony, the I'm so from sorry. From San Diego. Okay, hi. Can you talk about the aging process of the wine? Yes. From red to white. Yes. So there are, first of all, for all wine, you can age them in, there's really modern techniques, but I won't even get into that now, but stainless steel or oak, okay? So a lot of white wines are just going right into stainless steel. The winemaker does not want oak enhancing on that at all. So we're talking Sauvignon Blanc, some Chenin Blancs, things like that are going right into stainless steel. Um, for red wine, they're almost all done in oak barrels. Um, basically, it can be anywhere. You would want to, at a minimum, age a wine for 18 months. Champagne is an entirely different animal. You actually have to age a champagne for 15 months and three years if you want to do a vintage champagne. So if you if you want to do a non-vintage, um, the by the law it's 15 months. If you want to label it as a 2006, you have to do a minimum of three years in a barrel before you even bottle it. So. And there's a secondary fermentation with champagne. Champagne's a whole thing, and actually, I'm not, I don't know. Oh, you got it on. It's, ru it's, it's, uh, on it's just been running. Oh, it's okay, the Instagram, sorry. but it's just running. So Stanley and I are doing wine tours, and we're gonna take, uh, so I did this in my former business, running the Champagne Club, but basically we are gonna partner with Champagne Houses, small and larger, and do a beautiful mix, and take people for one week to Champagne, we're gonna do all the accommodations, tour buses, everything set, you just have to come. And we will have everything prepared in an entire itinerary. When are, when are you doing that? We're gonna start in spring of 2024. Because it's gonna be spring 20 2024. I'm not gonna do it in the fall because it's, it's quite a process to plan it and I want it to be outstanding. So with everything else we have going on, that would be the first. But we've done background work on it, and that's him and I already touring and connecting with a lot of the makers. And from my previous job, I have a list of probably at least 30 houses that would welcome me back with people that I would want to bring to their Maison. So. Are the champagne grapes the one that were replaced by the Americans because they went from here to there and after the phylloxera? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the <laughs> yeah, it's most of them, yeah. So American vines, basically there was an outbreak of an insect that nearly almost destroyed all of the French wine. Um, 
them and it had to be rebuilt basically by this insect. I forget the exact date, 18 something. Yeah, like. Nine, Sorry guys, I don't have the exact date of it, but it was, yeah. you're, you know exactly what you're talking about. It was yeah. all destroyed. It was all so destroyed. All the vine are now actually branched to an American. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, they should respect us more then, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, so basically, um, all the wine that you're drinking now. Did they? I didn't know that. Okay. Right, the Provenance. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know. Yeah. I, Chris, do you think when you were telling French wines might change over time, does it seem like some of the more traditional wine houses are being you know, taken over or run by younger people that have maybe studied in the United States or you know, other places that are bringing back those ideas? Do you think that's going to be a problem with French wine? Or is it going to take French wine away from one of the Good question. So many of the houses we visited had it was being passed down to their generation. Sorry. So many, do you agree? So many of the houses we visited, their generations were being passed down. So their dad was teaching the son and they were taking it over. So in that sense, yes, a younger generation is going to run it and they might have more modern ideas, but I feel like they were learning exactly why it was successful in the first place by the father or the grandfather but to the keep it going. Like Duval Lois, does anyone know Duval Lois? No? Okay, female, female run, her husband basically passed away and left her, she was a widow, she had three sons and left her to take over the whole champagne house and she's done an amazing job. And that's a house that I've taken clients to but now her sons are all running it. She's getting older, she's in her late 70s now. So, um, but they, I mean, we studied the history of the house and basically they're doing, they haven't changed that much of what they're doing. They, they're sticking no, to No, the, fr the French are all about tradition. They, right. That's kind of, so as far as what I've experienced in France, I feel like they're wanting their, their offspring to take it over and they're wanting it to be done how it has been done. But even with the new technology that they're oh, more like the stainless steel tanks? Yeah. That in the modern egg, the modern egg tanks and stuff. In Bordeaux, that was happening. Also, hand harvesting is kind of being replaced a lot by the manual harvesting and the trucks, which we did learn does affect the quality, unfortunately. Mm. Um, it's and just. Huh? We've done it in our research. Yeah, well. we had to yeah, do it. Yeah. It's actually so much better. You can tell that it's um, bottle is Burgundy now that you drink can go up to like 14 degree of alcohol, which is rare. You never yeah. imagine Pinot Noir to be that happy body. And not, they're not having a French bourbon, uh, I mean not a French. You know. And they're having to harvest the grapes earlier than yeah. predicted, which does affect. We wanted more ripeness and the phenolic ripeness, mm -hmm. especially. So they're having to then make up for that in the cellar. Right? It's gonna. Ch it's got. It's got to change things a lot, yeah. actually. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, dealing with global warming yeah. has to, mm -hmm. yeah. I have a really dumb question. Probably not dumb. <laughs> I, have a, I have one wine that I like. I thought you don't drink anything. Well, I, I, no, it's not that okay. I don't drink. I'm okay. just on a stupid diet. Oh, okay. okay. So I don't drink for that oh, reason. Oh, you're still doing, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I'm still doing that. my stupid diet. But the one wine that I like is a Morgon. It's so delicious, this one. You do? Oh, I'm so yeah. glad I'm not the only one. Gamay. It's a Beaujolais. Yeah. yeah. Right? And, and all I know about it is that it's been aged for in, in oak for five years. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Is that right or wrong? <laughs> I don't know. Aged in oak for five years? That's for what, a yes. Beaujolais, that's pretty, that's pretty long. A Morgon is like a Grand Cru. Yeah, so that's why it like can handle that longer, the aging. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There's something like 150 <coughs> Beaujolais or something. There are so many different labels under Beaujolais. Yeah. <coughs> there are. Beaujolais Nouveau, where everybody yeah, 
that's on November right. 24th. No, it's different. <coughs> it actually, that actually gives Beaujolais a bad name. Beaujolais the Beaujolais Nouveau, Nouveau because yeah. they've marketed crappy wine yeah. successfully. Like and then, yeah. right, and then, and then everybody thinks that Beaujolais is crappy wine. But there's so many Beaujolais. People don't even, we don't even right. know we're drinking it a lot of times. Mm -hmm. It's what, what I understand. Right. We should try the Beaujolais in it's the Barat. They have amazing collection. <laughs> in where? Where? In the Barat. They have great Beaujolais. Barat. Yeah. Krista? Yes. I asked you a question. Right? Yes, you Go did. Ahead. Okay, so I believe your question was, you want to know what a low, medium, and high-end red wine is. So a low and um, probably from the south, like a long, long dock. Long Ox dock. Occitani now. Huh? It's called the Occitani now. The name changed from long dock to yeah to Occitani. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I, I think wine region. Is I know it's the like yeah. Okay, but okay. So if you want to go high end, I would always at the minimum drink a Premier Cru of any of any appellation, I feel. So Stanley and I differ. I I love Northern Rhone, so Pote Roti, Cornoth, if you like rich, deep red wines. Southern Rhone, like Chateau Neuf de Pop and all of that is also very good high end and that's gonna give you they can they can blend wine in a Chateau Neuf de Pop thirteen different grapes. Most of them use five. I would say roughly, and the most common are Grenache, Syrah, and Mouvedre. Also, I recommend that blend alone. It's called a GSM of just those three from the south of France, Rhone Valley. Rhone Valley is good for medium priced and full priced. If you want to do full, you're going to look at Chateau Neuf de Pop and Cote Roti for a higher priced appellation. Some of the best and hard, hardest to find white wine. White Rhone here in France, whereas if you go to Total Wine in the United States and find a relatively decent selection. Yeah. But yeah, but I seriously, and also you guys, when you're looking at the label, make sure it has the appellation because I briefly showed how there's village and that step. You also want to make sure it says AOC Medoc, AOC Saint Emilion. You want to make sure that's on there. If it just says Bourgogne, it can be blended from anywhere in Burgundy, okay? So that's another really important thing on a label is making sure it has your AOC. Like Stanley had mentioned earlier, most winemakers are gonna say where the grapes are even coming from. That's really important to look at. And um, obviously a Premier Cru. So if I, if I drink a Chablis, I almost always, there's, Chablis, 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 Chablis Premier Cru and Chablis Grand Cru. I almost always will only drink a Chablis Premier Cru. And you can even get them affordable. You can get them for 20 something euros. Depends on the winemaker. So that's how I usually select wine if I if we're going for quality is, is looking at those key points. Because to answer your question, you can have a low end, medium and high end wine from any region in France. It's more you're gonna look at you're going to look at those determining factors to tell you what the quality level is going to be. And I'm not saying that a village wine is not going to be great. There are some, and we can point them out on a menu if we saw it, what based on the winemaker, if it's going to be decent or not. But So I don't want to knack that you have to be drinking Premier Cru and Grand Cru, but you're going to, you're going to notice the difference. So you that guys... your question? Okay. It, it's five o'clock, but how about one more question? And anything that uh, Krista you want to end with is fine too. Any yeah, I, one I more question? I I think they're wind out. Yeah. Yeah. He has one more. This, this actually is an American wine question. Okay. So is it my perception or American winemakers, especially red wines? I'm picking up there to see more sweet. Yeah. And it's like, are they just leaving more residual sugar to appeal the American? They're leaving more residual sugar in it. They're waiting to harvest them to the alcohol content because for the American, yes, because Americans want a richer, right. It's like, it's really strong and rich.
rich. And so in France, they're, as I said, France is so focused on if it pairs with the food. So you're not going to have an overly heavy, sweet red wine going. That's not even supposed to be sweet. It's going to, right? It's just going to overpower everything. It's not Manischewitz, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's a huge, that's a huge marketing thing. They're doing that for the palate. Yeah. Hmm? I'll ask them. Yeah. No. And also they're doing it with white wine. Chardonnay has to be like overly buttery. They're adding oak chips because new world process, you can add what you want. France is very strict. You can be adding sugars, you can be adding grape juice in California, you can be putting in wood chips, not just in a barrel age. So they stir around wood, wood chips and everything. Huh? I got my lawn in <laughs> Yeah, you can put your peaches in there. <laughs> so. yeah, which, is, which is why I always tell people in the U.S. look for, a, look for a, a, an equivalent burgundy coming from Oregon. Yes. From a French family like uh, the Good advice. Books are in the back. Willow will take your 20 bucks for each book. <laughs> Krista will sign. And thank you all for coming.